Hello, and welcome to the Washington United Methodist Church podcast. We hope you enjoy this week's sermon. Please stick around at the end for more information on where to find us and the blessing on Sunday. We have our scripture reading this morning coming from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Thanks be to God. All right, well, let's talk about revival here. You know, uh, this is our six-week kind of fall uh, congregational uh, sermon series, uh, congregational study on personal and church uh, spiritual revival. Uh, on the experience and the methods that John Wesley himself used to, to start uh, uh, a revival in his own life and a spiritual revival in England and America, which ultimately became you know, today's United Methodist Church as we know it. Um, if you weren't here last Sunday, let's, what we did is we, just a quick, uh, quick review of last Sunday to bring everybody up to speed. We looked at three kind of precursors to uh, revival that were present in John Wesley's young life that, uh, that he used to kind of springboard and he, uh, to, to start the revival. First, the first precursor was that he had parents, uh, especially his mother, who prayed for him every day, who, who were involved with his, his spiritual formation, and, uh, and they mentored him in the faith. That was important to him, uh, obviously crucial. Secondly, Wesley, we talked about, had this, this unique ability to be able to, because there was a lot of conflict, uh, theologically at, at the dinner table between his grandparents and his parents every Sunday, uh, he learned ha- to be able to see the truth in both sides of a theological controversy or issue and to articulate what w- we know today as what we call a via media, okay, a middle way, which allowed people and the gospel to move forward in love. And then thirdly, he learned mostly from his father's experience, you know, we talked about uh, his, his difficulties, uh, that when opposition and difficulties arise in your life, you don't give up and cut and run, but you turn to God and you persevere through those difficulties in determination and faith and triumph over them. So today we're going to follow John Wesley uh, through his young life, up through middle school, what we would call, the, I guess, middle school and high school, college, his early adulthood, his ninth, you know, into the 20s, and discover what influencing elements of uh, his faith develop, developed in him uh, that we call a longing for holiness. It's kind of uh, you know, our, our chapter, our title for today. So in our scripture today that Dennis read for us from uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, 13, 16, we, we know that Peter encourages us to prepare our minds for action, to discipline ourselves, to set all of our hope on the grace that Jesus Christ is going to bring us when he is revealed. And Peter encourages us to, like obedient children, do not conform to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all of your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, do you notice he says, the one who called you. In the very opening greeting, you know, a few verses before that, just the, 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 the second verse uh, in the opening sentences of his greeting to this letter, Peter, right out of the gun, lays out the reason for everything he's about to write and why it matters for us to do the things that, you know, that Dennis read for us here from the scripture today, saying, you, he says this right out of the gun in the greeting, he says, you have been chosen and destined by God and sanctified by the Spirit to be followers of Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? God chose you. That alone should make your day, shouldn't it? I mean, that's, that alone is absolutely wonderful news. I mean, really, can there be any greater compliment or privilege in all the world than to be chosen by God for anything? The word for chosen in the Greek of the New Testament is the word eklektos, and it describes anything that is specially chosen. It can describe, uh, you know, agriculturally, hand-picked fruit, okay, or produce, uh, articles, especially uh, chosen because they are just outstandingly well-crafted or well-made. And it was also used in the military uh, by commanders who would, who would hand-pick chosen troops for a critically important mission or operation because they could be trusted to carry through. 
And friends, you and I, the Bible says, have, have the honor of being specially chosen by God. And here's the thing. God always chooses people for service. The honor of being used for God's holy purposes in the world. That is a privilege, a great privilege. And of course, we know with great privilege comes what? Great responsibility, right? And challenges. But we all know this. This is nothing new to us, right? The honor and responsibility of being chosen for something important. We see it, you know, throughout life. I mean, it, at your job, your boss calls you into his or her office and says, you've been chosen. Upper management is, has chosen to groom you for, you know, a big promotion or a newly created position, you know, in a division. Or the coach ranks you out, you know, after, after practice has come to my office and, and he or she sits you down and says, hey, I want you, I'm choosing you, I'm looking to you to be next year's starting quarterback for our varsity, okay? Or next year's starting pitcher in the rotation for the softball team or whatever. Or the director of theater tells you that I want to cast you in the lead role of the next play. Or the creator of the universe tells you that because of your faith, you've been chosen to be empowered by God's own spirit to continue the work of the Savior of the world, God's Son, Jesus Christ. Wow. Nice to know you're wanted. Now, how much do you want it? Enough to do what's necessary to prepare to be successful in this new role that you've been chosen for, handpicked for? For example, with a job. Do you want that new promotion enough to stop sleepwalking through your day and start reading trade journals and learning everything you can about not just your, your job or your company, but your competitors and your industry and the economy? How about that uh, starting, starting position next year on the varsity? Do you want it enough to turn off the TV, get off social media and the couch and start running and lifting and eating right and practicing your sport when all your other friends are doing something else? And about that, uh, that lead role, do you want it enough to pour over the script and memorize your lines and work with the drama coach so that you can deliver your lines flawlessly and with feeling? Do you want it enough to live differently than the rest of your coworkers, your teammates, your classmates, and friends in order to obtain what you've been specially chosen for? Now, the root word for different in the New Testament is the word hagios, okay? I've, I've shared this with you enough that you can probably parrot it back to me here, what we're talking about. This, this should be familiar. I mean, we translate hagios as the word holy, right? And operationally, functionally, in use, hagios means always to be set aside or set apart from the ordinary, usually for the special purpose or use of something. And for example, you know, the temple. The temple was said to be hagios because it was a building that was used differently than all other buildings. The Sabbath day, Sunday is hagios because it's a different day from all other days. We worship and rest on the Sabbath, not work. And the person who follows Jesus Christ, Christians, you and me. Peter says that we are hagios because we are to be different than other people. Our lives are to look different in, in uh, to others in terms of the choices that we make in how and where and with whom we choose to spend our time, talent, and treasures. Friends, you and I have been chosen by God for a task in the world and for a, you know, a, a destiny in all of eternity. We have been chosen to obey, to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. And not only that, but to reproduce his life in our own lives, which among, uh, among other things, means to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, inviting them and helping them to become followers of Jesus themselves, and so to share in our work of changing the world. Now, John Wesley wanted to have this living relationship with the God of love so much that he was willing to be different in order to experience that wonderful life. He was willing to to become holy. Of course, the relevant question is, well, how did he do it, right? 
and can we use any of his practices in our own longing for holiness? Well, let's see. John Wesley attended what we would call middle school and, and high school in uh, London, living far away from his family in Epworth. And in his journal, he says, you know, honestly, that because he didn't have his parents in his life anymore influencing him, kind of got sloppy with his faith there for, for a few years. Uh, but after he graduated high school from Charterhouse, he, uh, he immediately entered into college at Oxford University, where one biographer noted that Wesley went to Starbucks and Caribou, coffee house. It says he frequented the coffee house. He uh, must have gone to Iowa. You know, he rode on the river, you know, just like in Iowa City. He played backgammon. He shot a lot of pool. He played chess and cards and tennis. In other words, Wesley was a normal college student, okay? After he earned his bachelor's in 1724, he didn't go out and test the, uh, you know, the job market. He went right back into, uh, into school and got his master's degree and started preparing for his ordination into the ministry. And as he got closer to the time to being ordained, um, Wesley says, I kind of started taking my faith more, uh, more seriously. I started kind of paying attention to it more, reading more. And one author who really impacted him at this time was Jeremy Taylor who had written a book called The Rule and Exercises of Holy Living. One thing that just grabbed Wesley's heart and mind from Taylor's uh, reading is something that Taylor wrote about. He basically expanded on what pa uh, the Apostle Paul wrote uh, in 1 Corinthians 10.31 when Paul said, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything to the glory of God, you know, as if you were doing it for God's glory. Taylor taught that everything we do, every action we take, every action of nature becomes religious. Even every meal can be an act of worship as well as an act of prayer. So Taylor's words really challenged Wesley to start looking at everything he did and doing it to the glory of God. He would later write after reading Taylor's work, he said, you know, instantly I had to resolve to dedicate all my life to God, all my thoughts, my words, my actions. Well, so we go a few years farther down the road and Wesley's continuing to reading the, the, the devotional classics and he came upon the Imitation of Christ uh, written by the 14th century scholastic monk Thomas Akempis, uh, which still sells thousands of copies today, probably mostly to guys in seminary who know <laughs> you have, to, have to read it, but it, it's still a, a, a wonderful, uh, wonderfully strong selling book. And this book also really affected Wesley and his thinking. He would later write about it. He said, I saw that after reading this book, that just, just giving my life actions to God wasn't going to do me any good. I could do all the service I wanted, but unless I gave God my heart, my whole heart, it would avail me nothing. Wesley knew that if he really wanted to serve God, it meant that he had to love God. He had to fall in love with God and the things of God, long for God. So the third book then that greatly influenced Wesley's life and the revival then that he would later lead was William Law's book. It was just, just recently been published there and it was called A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. And it convinced John Wesley of this. You can't be what he called an, an almost Christian, okay? The call in life and the mission of a follower of Jesus Christ is just too far of an important thing to not take totally seriously. You just can't play at it. You can't be a half a Christian, Wesley said. That's what the angel of the church in Laodicea said against uh, that church in, in Revelation 3.16, where it says, you know, you're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm about your relationship with God, so I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You know, you're being a half a Christian. So Wesley decided at the relatively young age of 27 that he was going to be what he called an altogether Christian, kind of like all-in Christian, right? To be an altogether Christian for him meant that you, you have to do three things. You have to live out three things in your life. First is, you've got to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you have to love your, your neighbor as you love yourself. You know, it's basically the two great commandments that Jesus talked to us about that sum up all the law and the prophets, right, in the Gospels. Secondly, he said, you have to trust in the goodness and grace of God that is made available to you and every person through Jesus Christ's work on the cross. And then thirdly, he said, you not only have to, have to welcome, but you have to seek out and you have to experience the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life 
That's what it's for. That's what it wants to do. So as John did these things and he continued to read, he became more and more aware that there was something more and more to his faith and holiness that, that, than he knew before. And he found that God was making him hungrier and hungrier all the time to find what that more was. Well, that more kind of came as a request from his younger brother, Charles. Okay? John already graduated from Oxford. He was serving as a, a kind of an associate pastor in his father's church. And Charles was now the little brother up in college at Oxford. And Charles wrote John, his big brother, a letter asking him, would you, would you kind of mentor me and a couple other guys in, in the faith, kind of be our spiritual mentors here, uh, and, and just meet with us? So he, John started meeting with them for prayer, and they did some conversation, you know, spiritual conversations and talks. Well, after that, then they started meeting for prayer and conversation, but also they started adding Bible and devotional readings and study, and then they started kind of going to chapel services together when John was on campus. They celebrated communion. They even fasted twice a week, right? But for Wesley and uh, Charles and their friends, they knew that just being in a small group meant more than just fellowship and devotion and study, okay? Being an all-together Christian meant that you, you not only loved God with all your heart, but you loved your neighbor as you loved yourself. And you couldn't do that if you were just sitting in a study, you know, looking at each other uh, and talking about it. So they thought of Matthew 25, right? Uh, and the, the parable of the goats and the sheep, the final judgment. And they remember where the king, Jesus says, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And so the group says, you know, we got to live this out. So they immediately started going out and visiting people in prison. You know, encouraging them, praying for them, trying to help meet their needs. You know, they're in debtor's prison, just like <laughs> John and Charles Wesley's dad was, you know, we found last week. And then they started calling on the elderly and the shut-in, and, and they started caring for the poor and uh, trying to help feed them. And they even hired a teacher to help address the educational needs of low-income kids in, in the area. And this experience of, of loving God and then loving others, pursuing not only just spiritual disciplines aimed at deepening your faith, but pairing that with acts of compassion and mercy, you know, serving as, as Christ's hands and feet in the world among the poor and those in need of care, those two, those two sides became kind of one coin, two sides of the, of the same coin for Wesley. And it, it became a, a hallmark of the small group life in Methodism, both then and right up to today. So, friends, as we, as we draw to a close with our second time together regarding this spiritual revival that John Wesley was experiencing in his own life and then was, and was leading, I want to draw your attention to one final element that was critical to Wesley's own spiritual revival and then the mass revival that he led in England and you know, in America. Wesley and the other Methodists, as we said earlier, invited, they actively invited the Holy Spirit to change them. Wesley held up the doctrine of redemption that he found in the New Testament, okay? Because he said, look, Jesus taught, uh, or we know that the New Testament teaches us that Jesus purchases us from sin, as we are. And then the Holy Spirit comes in and starts working in our lives to restore our lives to their God-intended uh, state, okay? To the state of human beings who love God with all their heart and who love others as they love themselves, you know? part of that abundant life that Jesus came to bring us all. So, trying to get an image of that in our lives. How do you appropriate that, you know, as a modern day illustration to kind of show us those experiences that, that Wesley used. Last night, uh, Leslie and I were, oh, well, I guess it was Friday night. Leslie and I, we came in in the middle of a movie like we always do on cable, and so we watched it and called it, and we watched the whole thing, but it was called Yes Man. It was, a, you know, star, it was a romantic, a rom-com, a romantic comedy with starring funny man Jim Carrey and Bradley Cooper and Zoe Deschanel. And Carrey plays this kind of mild-mannered loan officer in a bank who lives, who lives a really ultra-conservative, play-it-safe, stick-to-the-boring-routine-of-life way of doing things. Until he's challenged by his best friend, Bradley Cooper, to, to go to a conference and hear an international self-help guru challenge him to change his life for the better by saying yes to absolutely everything, every opportunity that comes along and that confronts him, no matter how bizarre or uncomfortable you know, it is. 
which he does for a year. And during that next year, oh my gosh, all kind of things happen to him. He learns to play the guitar and the piano. He learns to fly an airplane. He, he bungee jumps. He learns to speak Chinese fluently. And he goes everywhere and he does everything and he meets absolutely everyone. And yes, there were challenges and even problems with some of those experiences. Funny ones in the movie, of course. But together, those experiences totally changed his life for the better. It just expanded and enriched and, and gave him more community and fellowship and joy in to his life than he ever had before when he just kept his head down, said no, and played it safe. So friends, in the same way, all the spiritual practices that we have available to us, like prayer, you know, these opportunities, worship, communion, reading the Bible, Bible study, meeting with other Christians for fellowship or for ministry service to others. These are all experiences the Holy Spirit uses to transform our lives into the life that God intends and desires for each of us to enjoy immensely. And there's some other upcoming experiences to add to those already mentioned. Those would be like the Noah's Ark potluck at Rubel's next Friday, a wonderful fellowship gathering here. How about marriage date night up at, at, at Ankeny uh, United Methodist Church on November 8th? You know, we should get a caravan to go up there to that. Or the men's Acts outing, okay? I'm sure there's going to be a short devotional on the book of Acts when we get them thrown those, right, Brian? Okay, thank you for doing that. Been waiting all week to say that, you know? And then, of course, the introduction to the small group life experiences that Deanne and I will be uh, sh sharing with people who would like to uh, attend that. But let's not forget, reading to grade schoolers through Change a Child's Story. Stacy said that, that sign-up sheet's going to be coming uh, very quickly here. Or that you can always serve a meal at the table and sit down with some folks and, and have fellowship with them and do some ministry. The question is, will you? Will you say yes? Will you invite the Holy Spirit to change you? Will you say yes to these experiences that God makes available to you that will allow the Holy Spirit the room to come in and do that work of, of wonderfully changing and restoring our lives? Let's just give Adam Hamilton, he's the author of this, this revival series, let's give him the last word today uh, as, as he ends this chapter for us. He writes, sometimes when you've been a Christian, for years and years, you become comfortable, content, satisfied, and you can even lose your passion to be restored. Maybe it's time for you to place your life in God's hands once again, to invite the Holy Spirit to begin a fresh restoration, and to either begin or maybe reclaim some of the spiritual practices in your life. Amen. Thank you for listening to this week's sermon. We hope you enjoyed it. We have two services each week, an 8.30 traditional service and a 10 a.m. contemporary service. You can find out more information at walkviewchurch.org. We hope to see you soon. Now on to the benediction. Let's become one. Reach out and grab a hold of the hand of somebody standing next to you. What a wonderful hymn to end on, be sent out into the world. We, we pray that God would open our mouth and let us say yes you know, to the Spirit. Yes, come in and, uh, and make us new again. Start your restoration uh, on us. And open our eyes that we might see all the wonderful experiences that God has prepared for us to enjoy and be used to be revived. Friends, now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit keep your hearts and minds together as one, now and forever. Amen.